What the f Playground arguments of who would win in a fight are as common as they are endless. No matter what arguments you may make for why Superman can beat Goku or why Johnny Bravo can roll Mike Tyson, there is always going to be someone that you just can't convince. That is, until today. Because I intend to create a perfect mathematical way of determining which army from Fire Emblem is definitively the strongest and thus would beat the rest of the fight. Now, while others use feats and abilities and other things that can be open to interpretation, I differ. No. I intend to use cold, hard, indisputable numbers. That's right. So, Fire Emblem games have taken to giving units power ratings to help simplify how strong they are to new players. And a good player will tell you that this isn't a perfect indicator of unit strength because the actual power comes from how their stats are spread as opposed to their just raw numbers, uh, hence the existing of min-maxing in RPGs. And to those people, I say, shut up. Now, obviously, I can't just use these in-game unit power rankings because, one, they vary for everyone, and two, they don't exist in older games, so I couldn't really use it anyways. No, the calling that I have received is a much higher calling. It is the majesty of statistical analysis. That's right, I am taking the stat average of every unit in every game into account. But not exactly like you might think. You see, in Fire Emblem, the playable characters don't always make up the exact same army. Sometimes you get an option between armies, sometimes you control different armies that fight each other, kind of like the little kids smashing action figures against each other. So we're going to divide up some of the individual games into sub-armies, leaving us with the following groups. I'm going to take a sip of my water real quick. Marth's army from Ministry of the Emblem, Ohm's army from Shadows of Olympia, Silica's army from Shadows of Olympia, Sigurd's army, Solop's army, Leif's army from Thracia 776, Roy's army, Elliewood, Lynn, and Hector's combined group, Erica and Ephraim's army, the Grail army from Radiant Dawn, the Silver army from Radiant Dawn, and the Hawk army from Radiant Dawn, Chrome's shepherds from Awakenings, the Hoshidans from Fates, the Norians from Fates, the Blue Lions, the Black Eagles, the Golden Deer, and the Church, all from Three Houses, and finally, our Toothpaste Brigade from Engage. As for the rules, we'll be judging the most modern iteration of every army, all potentially recruitable characters characters will be considered as part of the army, even if that's impossible in the base game, meaning characters such as Sonya and Dean will both be counted for Selica's army. If hard mode bonuses are available, we'll judge the units with those in mind. Skills do not matter. Constitution, build, whatever you want to call it, does not matter. Post game, does not matter. Awakening side quests, do not matter. Fates captures, do not matter. DLC does not matter. Die. Now that we know what we're working with, we gotta ask what we're working on. You could have the best base stats in the series, but give it a few levels and you'll only be the fifth strongest unit instead of the first. So we're gonna be running with a tournament style for four different rounds. Round one will have base stats and every unit available. Pretty self-explanatory. Round two will use base stats and maximum deployment, as in Fire Emblem Lords aren't all created equal. So we're gonna consider the maximum deployment slots in any given game as the maximum number of units that a given Lord or tactician can actively command on the battlefield. Meaning if in Binding Blade, the highest deployment limit is 18, the army can only use their best 17 units plus Roy. Finally, rounds three and four are repeats of round one and two, but with stat averages as opposed to bases. And if you don't know what that means, be more patient. I'll get to it when I get to it. But let's begin at the beginning. Round one. This was fairly easy to gather, as the base stats for almost every unit in the series are on Serena's Forest, making it a quick copy-paste, grind it into paste on a spreadsheet for our stats. Also, if you don't recognize the names, that's because Serenus Forest uses weird versions for the games that don't have official translations. So yeah, I don't know either. But I did encounter a bit of a hiccup with Celeph's army, spoilers for a 27-year-old game, but in Genealogy of the Holy War, there is a second generation of units who you get to use whose stats are all based on pairings from the first generation, which means that their bases are all different depending on circumstances, so we need a control. Enter Arden. I'm normally crying Arden is now the father of every child in Jude Draw. I like that. Sorry, I don't make the rules. Arden is just your daddy. Ha ha ha! From here, we can get the stats we need from the wiki. And now we have all of our stats from Gen 2. 
As you probably expected, the more units the army has, the higher it generally ends up. The bottom four are all from three houses, boasting the impressive combo of barely any of them being there, plus they're all about as strong as fish sticks. Next up are our Echo's Lovebirds. Alm and Selica have very similar power levels, but the duo of Sonya and Dean are enough to push Selica slightly above. Next is Sigurd's army, which honestly really shouldn't be all that surprising since the game is balanced around being able to field every unit. And then the other small armies from Radiant Dawn, although Erika's army is here too, and I didn't really expect that because I guess I always just assume that Sacred Stones has a standard big GBA army. But no, I guess it truly is just Seth versus the world. Then there's a huge leap in power between 10 and 9, and from this point forward, these armies could beat up your dad. 9 and 8 are Hoshido and Nor, and I take back what I said about it being unrealistic that just one person could completely change the tide of war in these games, because good lord, those two numbers are close. Next up is Seliph's army actually being carried by alternate units instead of being brought down by them for once. Then there's a bunch of super armies with lots of submissive and benchable units, like you'd expect. The Shepherds, Ellie Woods, Leif, the Divine Dragon, Roy, Marth, all fall into this category. So now we have our baseline, our first round of combat. But now's when things start to get more interesting as we begin to throw wrench after wrench at our favorite sword-wielding psychopaths. As I mentioned before, different games have different deployment slots, so this will be our way of seeing which armies would win in a practical scenario at base level. Oh look, it's deja vu. But that is kind of the entire point of Three Houses, that you're building every unit from a worthless cretin into a super soldier, so I guess it makes sense. Now, Alm and Celica being next is more surprising since these are games without deployment limits, and I assumed their numbers would give them an advantage, but nope they still suck. Marth is next, proving that having the greatest force means nothing if you don't know how to use it. Then we have Ellie Wood and Erica, followed by a surprisingly highly placed Leif. I did not expect that. After Leif are Hoshido and Nor. It's, it's weird that Nor is higher, right? Alir is next, followed by the weakest army from Radiant Dawn. Then Krom's Shepherds. Roy is in fifth, doing a good impression of the people who played his game and getting carried by hard mode bonuses. Next up is the Silver Army from Radiant Dawn, because everyone in that game is a superhuman. Third place is Sigurd's Army, despite his lack of a deployment limit. Get your life together, man! Second place, somehow overcoming the massive force that is Sigurd, is Gigachad Ike and his Grail Army. And finally, winning through sheer numbers is Selef. Good lord, look at that leap. Round three is when things start to get annoying. Because unlike base stats, you can't just pull stat averages for everyone up on Serenus Forest. Well, you can for a few, so let's get those out of the way. Now, the problem child is once again, Sella. You ruin everything you touch! I spent two days scouring the internet looking for the stat averages of his army but I could not find a decent resource even for calculating them. I was worried that I'd have to figure out how to do it by hand, but thankfully I did not have to do that. Hey, it's like 2 a.m. and I forgot to record this part in the script and I think there's some audio going on in the background, but long story short, uh, I used Oifebot, didn't know how to use it. Uh, shout outs to Mecca for helping me out with that. Uh, if you somehow haven't seen him, go check him out. So yeah. After using the bot to calculate the growths of every unit, I continued using Serenus Forest for everything up to Awakening and Oife for Awakening and Fates. Now, here's a little twist for you. Three Houses is a nightmare to get stat averages for because what averages? Everyone is essentially a villager that can become anything. <laughs> Turned out not to be much of a problem at all because there is an entire website dedicated to calculating Three Houses growth rates. I really do love the internet sometimes. So I just used the fandom's assumed canon class lines for all the units, and voila, this was surprisingly easy. Now we can get onto the actual fights. Once again, Alm and Selica are resting pretty at the bottom of the pack, poor souls. Followed again by some of the Three Houses armies, but this time not the entire pack. Only the Golden Deer and Church of Seros this time before we get to Seeger. Man, you are just the face of disappointment today. Then we have the Blue Lions followed by the Grail Army, guess they just couldn't keep up with those growth rates, and then the avian duo of the Hawks and the Black Eagles. They can soar above the competition up to about 12th place. Good job. Then we have the Silver Army, and at this point I assume you get the pattern of less units leading to a lower ranking. 
Then we have Erica, Zelif, Eliwood, and Leif. You know, I was actually expecting Leif to be dead last because of the stat caps at the ratio. Then we have the Toothpaste Brigade, followed by Nor. And now we get to see the inflated growths of Modern Fire Emblem come into play as two of the top four are the Hoshidans and the Shepherds. But in between them is Roy, who I have to assume is just being carried by hard mode bonuses, but no amount of raw power can compete with the sheer number of units that Marth has at his disposal. Seriously, this is just ridiculous. And finally, we have our last round, stat averages with deployment limits. Here is probably the most realistic depiction of how a fight between these armies would go. And in last place, we have Marth, proving once and for all that despite how strong your army's potential is, you never want Marth as your commander. Our next flop is Eliwood, but this makes sense since in FE7, you're not fighting an army or a war, you're fending off assassins and the battles are very intentionally small scale. Then we have Leif. This is where you belong, my dear child. I am sorry. Now, I didn't use the maximum deployment slots for Thracia and opted for the second most for one reason in particular, because the chapter that feels the most units isn't really indicative of Leif's prowess as a commander. It's a demonstration of his incompetence. Next up, we have Alm and Celica. You may not be the worst this time, but you certainly still suck. And back to the topic of incompetent lords with too much power at their hand, we have Roy. Frankly, I don't know if this was intentional, but it makes so much sense if it was. The Hawk army is next, no surprise there, and Erika's army is not too far above. Then we have a bit of a twist as Hoshido and Noor are surprisingly low ranked on this list. I am sorry, Corin, but neither Lobster nor Horny can save you now. Then we have the Engage army, which has been pretty middling thus far, so it's no shock that it remains dead center. And now we have our first Three Houses house. The Three Houses units are total monsters, so even with lesser deployment, it makes sense that they'd wreck shop. Or in Claude's case, hold their own on a semi-even playing field. Our next group is the Grail Army, followed closely by the Church of Saros. Funnily enough, this is a fight that I'd really like to see take place. Then we have Sigurd, carried again by his numbers, and, well, Sigurd. The Silver Army is next, proving definitively that growths beat bases if they've already had time to grow. Then, the Blue Lions, just barely losing out on the Black Eagles. Very fitting. And number two is the Shepherds. Is anyone really surprised? And if you haven't guessed her number one by now, it's Selif, who is just riding the absolute high of technicalities right now. The lack of deployment limits in genealogy combined with the several optional units means, while it may not be earned in the slightest, Selif technically has the strongest army in a straight fight. With that in mind, who has the actual strongest army? You see, if we take the results from every round and then average them together, we will find which army consistently performs the highest and which one gets consistently dunked on. And I have the answer right here it would be a pretty disappointing video if I didn't. But before we get to that, this video was sponsored by nobody. Nobody is watching this. <laughs> the weakest army in the mainline Fire Emblem games is a tie. Between who? Take a wild guess. Alm and Celica, consistent bottom two, somehow have the weakest armies. I am appalled. Next we have the Golden Deer. Their middling performance in the final round was not enough to save them from the fate of failure. And the Church of Saros ain't faring that much better either. And if you think we're done with three houses, you are sorely mistaken as even the top placing spots for Blue Lions and the Black Eagles in round four did nothing to prevent this abysmal placement. Next we have Erica and Ephraim, which was actually really surprising to me since throughout the course of Sacred Stones, their army felt way stronger to use than several of the armies above them. But to be fair, that's probably got more to do with the average enemy strength in that game as opposed to your actual units. In 12th place, we have the Hawk Army, everyone's favorite from Radiant Dawn. I know you're all devastated by such a poor showing. Tied with them is Eliwood, which is an odd connection. No further comment. Number 11 is Leif, and I am just happy that my boy made it up so high because life has given this man no favors and he deserves something. Sigurd is 10, which is honestly just the result of installing a preteen as your head tactician. And trapped in ninth place is Marth, because despite his overwhelming force, he is quite the underwhelming commander. Next up is Ike and his Grail army, followed by Nor and Hoshido, which just barely ekes out ahead of Nor, honestly making the entire conflict of fates kinda meaningless. Tied with them is the Silver army, which I guess means that Micaiah is a better leader than Ike. 
And fourth, we have Pepsi Man. And sure, it's a modern FE game. You knew it'd be pretty high. In third place, with an average ranking of 6.5, we have Roy. I think it's just a combination of having a lot of backup units in case your favorites die, as well as having just absurdly strong monsters with hard mode bonuses. Second place might come as a shock to you, but the king of technicality himself, Selif. Despite placing first in half the rounds, his all holds barred results were pretty consistently mediocre. And despite never taking an entire round of themselves, the number one consistently highest ranked army was the Shepherds, proving once and for all that you don't need to win to win. Anyways, thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this, let me know. I really enjoyed making this and have some other similar stuff that I thinking about making. If there was anything you were particularly surprised by, uh, you can let me know because who Lord knows I was surprised by a couple results. Like, good Lord, Roy was blindsiding. Anyways, I am contractually obligated to ask you to subscribe to my channel as <laughs> has my soul and will not release it unless I get more subscribers than Sonic VR Chat RP. I do not make the rules, but my soul is bound by them. So please, I could really use the help.